Hi everyone, welcome back to Grounded Haven and welcome to the first pantry challenge meals video of 2023. In this video and over the next couple of months, I'm going to be showing you a lot of the meals that we're having from our pantry, whether that's from bulk goods, things from our winter garden, or things that we've preserved from over the last growing season. I'll be showing you a lot of the meals that we make and the ways we utilize a lot of the things that we have grown and preserved. I've got a lot of new and fun things to share with you today, so let's get started. For our first meal, we are going to have shrimp tacos with a carrot and cabbage slaw. I'm going to start by making the slaw and first we're going to make a dressing. I'm going to take a few tablespoons of plain unsweetened Greek yogurt. You can also use mayo or sour cream. Then I'm going to squeeze in the juice of half a lime and then I'm going to season this with salt and pepper and I'm just going to whisk this together. And this should make a nice creamy tangy dressing for our slaw. And the lime juice helps to thin it out a little bit so that we can coat our vegetables nicely with it later on. Then I'm going to start slicing up my vegetables. I have half of a small head of cabbage. This is some of our homegrown cabbage. Or if you have a large one, you could probably just do a quarter for this. And I'm taking out the cores. And then I'm just going to slice this as thinly as possible. Next, I'm going to prep one carrot and I'm going to shred it using a julienne peeler. I really like this tool, especially for when I'm making slaw. It helps you create these nice long shredded ribbons almost that mix in really nicely with the cabbage and other vegetables. It's definitely a handy tool to have because I really don't like julienning carrots. So I'll leave a link for this in the description box if you're interested. Next, I'm going to thinly slice one small red onion. This is one of the last red onions from our garden from the year, and a lot of them were starting to go soft, so I am just using those up as quickly as possible. So I'm just thinly slicing this and then adding it to the slaw mixture. Lastly, I have a tiny bunch of fresh cilantro, which has been doing really nicely in the garden, even in the cold. And I'm just going to chop that up finely. And then we are done with all the vegetables for the slaw. So I can just go ahead and mix that all together. It will seem a little thick at first, but as the vegetables sit in the lime juice and the salt, this will draw out moisture from them and it will thin out the dressing in about half an hour. So I'm gonna set that to the side. And now we're going to prepare our shrimp. I have some frozen shrimp that I pulled out last night and let it defrost in the fridge. So it is all ready to cook with today. I'm going to season that with salt, pepper, and some chili powder and mix that all together and let it sit in this spice mixture for a few minutes while I start cooking the tortillas. I've prepped my tortilla dough earlier, maybe about like an hour ago. I always do my tortilla dough ahead of time and let it sit for at least half an hour because this helps to relax all of the gluten in the flour and it makes it a lot easier to roll. And I'll put the ingredients and measurements for these tortillas in the description box as well. It's a really simple process. I just mix everything together until it's combined. I don't need it or anything and let it sit for half an hour. And then when it's time to make my tortillas, I can just portion it out into small little rounds and then roll them out as thinly as possible. I like my tortillas to be a little bit on the smaller side for tacos. So I'm just going to roll those out and then we are going to start cooking these in a hot cast iron skillet.
after I'm done making the tortillas, I'm adding a little bit of avocado oil to my pan and now we're going to cook the shrimp. I'm just gonna add this to the hot pan and this will cook up in no time. Shrimp cooks really quickly, so it is great for a weeknight dinner and you don't need to like marinate it for a long time ahead of time either, which is great. So I'm just going to put those into the pan and even it out so that it's in a single layer so that each shrimp has contact with the hot pan and gets nicely browned. After about a minute, I'm going to flip those and let the other side brown and you can see how they're already starting to cook. They're turning from gray to pink and they're getting some really nice color, both from the hot pan and also from the spice mixture. So they'll just need about another minute on the other side and when they're done cooking, I'm going to transfer them into my bowl and finish it off with a squeeze of fresh lime juice. So that's everything we need to prep for the tacos. We have our vegetable slaw, our spiced shrimp, and fresh tortillas. I also pulled out some other extras for the meal. I had some spiced rice that I had made previously in the week. I also had some pickled radishes and red onions, as well as some canned salsa that I canned in the summer. To assemble the tacos, I like to have a really nice big bed of that slaw. Top it with a few shrimp, and then we'll also add some fresh sliced radishes as well. I feel like shrimp tacos just need a fresh, crunchy slaw. It's just a perfect pairing, and I knew when we harvested the cabbage this year that this was a meal that I wanted to make with it. So that was our first meal of the week. Moving on to the second one, we're going to have a vegetarian barbecue chicken pizza along with some roasted cauliflower. So first I'm going to start off by making the pizza dough, which I do ahead of time in the afternoon. Here are the ingredients that I'm going to be using, and I pretty much just dump everything into the bowl of my stand mixer, and then I let my stand mixer do the work and knead the dough for me. After the dough has been kneading for a few minutes and has formed a nice smooth ball, I am going to transfer it to another bowl. I usually just let my dough rise in the same stand mixer bowl, but I was using my stand mixer for something else immediately after, so I'm just transferring it to a different bowl which I have oiled with olive oil, and I'm gonna make sure to coat all the sides of my dough and let that rest. I don't always coat my dough with oil for bread and things, but since we're going to be adding plenty of olive oil later on, a little extra while it's rising won't hurt. So after that's risen for an hour and a half to two hours, I'm going to take a sheet pan and add a few tablespoons of olive oil and make sure I get this sheet pan really nicely oiled up, spread it out into a nice layer with my fingers making sure to get over the edges and here's what our dough looks like. You can see that it's forming some nice big bubbles and has about doubled in size. I'm going to kind of just pop any of those big bubbles and punch down the dough a little bit. Then I'm going to transfer it to my sheet pan and start stretching it out very gently. When you first do this process immediately after the first rise, you'll see that the dough really wants to stretch back on itself and it's gonna kind of fight you as you're trying to stretch it. But after I've done as much as I can and the dough just keeps pushing back, I'm going to cover this with another sheet pan for about 15 minutes. I'll come back to it in 15 minutes and that time will allow the gluten to relax again and then I can go in again and stretch out the dough and you can see how it's already a lot more lax and it's easier to stretch it out. 
It's a little slippery because of the oil, but I can pretty much get it to the edges of the sheet pan after that first rest. Coating the sheet pan with olive oil is a process almost as if you're making focaccia and it's going to fry the bottom of your pizza dough as you're baking it and you'll get a nice crispy crust out of it. I'm gonna cover that again with the other sheet pan and let that rest and rise for another hour. So when it's almost time to cook our pizza, I am going to prep some of the other ingredients. And for the vegetarian barbecue chicken that we're using, it's actually going to be soy curls. These are Butler soy curls that I got from Azure Standard, which is the best place I have found to get these. They have them for a really good price. So I will leave a link to Azure Standard in the description box if you're interested. And I really love these soy curls because they are so easy to prepare. They come as a dehydrated soy curd and you basically just soak it with cool water for 10 minutes and they are ready to cook with it could not be any easier and it's a really great vegetarian or vegan substitute you can see how the chunks kind of look like chicken tenders you'll see it even more after they've soaked so while those soak for a few minutes, I'm going to prep some cauliflower to have alongside our pizza. And I'm just going to be roasting this really simply. This is cauliflower that I picked from the garden. And you can see that some of the florets are a little bit damaged because they were left in the cold when our temperatures dropped really low. But I'm just gonna try and cut out any of those kind of brown spots and use whatever I can. It's really hard for us to grow cauliflower. So I definitely am not going to waste these just because of some brown spots. And the best way to cut cauliflower is to try and cut it only through the stem. Try not to cut it through the florets. And after you cut through the thicker stem part, you can kind of break apart the florets with your hands. And this way you don't get a lot of like little ricey cauliflower bits as you cut it. Cause if you try and cut through the florets, they will kind of crumble. But if you break it apart with your hands, they stay in nice whole pieces. So after cutting those into bite-sized pieces, I am going to season this with olive oil, salt, and pepper, and just mix that up. And we will be roasting these along with our pizza when it's ready to cook. Here's what the soy curls look like after just that short soaking. I'm going to drain this off and as I pull one of these out, you can see how much the texture really does look like chicken. It doesn't taste like meat, so don't be expecting that, but the texture is like really chewy and I find that it's a really great meat substitute. So now I'm going to coat this with some homemade barbecue sauce. This is a peach and jalapeno barbecue sauce. I made a big batch of this a few weeks ago and I portioned it out in the freezer into these little containers and I had pulled one out for this meal. So I am going to mix that in with the soy curls and this is going to be the sauce for the pizza but I also just want to coat the soy curls in it as well to give them some flavor since they don't have much of their own flavor on their own. After I mix that up I am going to spread it onto my pizza dough and you can see how that looks after another hour rising in the pan. It has gotten really nice and fluffy and has kind of spread out to the edges of the pan a little bit more. I'm going to try my best to even out this sauce and soy curl mixture along the surface of the pizza. Honestly, I probably could have used a little bit more barbecue sauce, but this was all I had, so we are going to make do. And after I've spread that all out, I am going to top this with some fresh mozzarella, which I tear into pieces. And with fresh mozzarella, you really don't need or want to cover the entire surface of the pizza with it because it will spread as it melts and also it's nice to have areas that are exposed so that any moisture can evaporate so you don't end up with a really overly soggy pizza. 
and then we are going to add a few more toppings. I've pulled out some freshly diced onion as well as some frozen bell peppers that I froze in the summer from the garden and also some frozen chopped pineapple. And if you are one of those people who doesn't think that pineapple belongs on pizza, then I'm sorry to tell you that you are wrong. I definitely think that pineapple goes on certain pizzas and I think that it is especially a great pairing with like a barbecue chicken kind of business because something about like the juiciness and the sweetness of the pineapple pairs really nice with the barbecue sauce, especially with the peach and jalapeno one that I made. So we are definitely a household that puts pineapple on our pizza and I am not ashamed of that. A sheet pan pizza might not be the most traditional or authentic pizza, but even though I am generally something of a food snob, I am definitely not snobby when it comes to pizza. I am firmly in the camp that pretty much all pizza is good, even if it's not great pizza, it's still gonna be to some extent delicious. So that is pretty much all ready to bake, and now on my other sheet pan, I'm going to line that with parchment paper and spread our prepped cauliflower on there, and then we can bake both of these in the oven at 450 degrees for about 25 minutes. Here is what the pizza and the cauliflower look like when they have come out of the oven. And one little trick I like to do if my pizza comes out of the oven and the top is perfect, but the crust on the bottom isn't quite as crispy as I would like, I slice it up into our portions and then I will put it in a cast iron pan and just let it fry the bottom of that pizza for a few minutes. That way with the baking time in the oven, the cheese is melted and all the toppings are cooked, but putting it in the pan will just crisp up that bottom really nicely. And I don't always have to do this, it really just depends on like how wet the toppings are that I put on or if I have like a wet sauce. But whenever I don't have a crust that is as crispy as I would like, this always does the trick. So there is our finished meal with the vegetarian barbecue chicken pizza and the roasted cauliflower. And the great thing about making a nice big sheet pan pizza like this is that we always have plenty of leftovers and we can just heat up this pizza throughout the week for really quick lunches. The next meal I'm going to show you is a zucchini polenta with some garlicky butter shrimp, kind of a twist on the classic shrimp and grits. So first I'm going to start off by making the polenta. I'm putting four cups of water into my pot and then I'm going to add one cup of cornmeal. Give that a little bit of a mix and make sure that cornmeal is not clumping up. If it is, then you can whisk it. And then I have some shredded zucchini that was frozen. When you defrost frozen zucchini, it will release a lot of moisture. So I drained that in a strainer and then added that into the pot. Then I'm going to season this with plenty of salt and pepper. And this will have to cook for about 25 to 30 minutes to fully cook and hydrate that cornmeal. And I'll make sure to stir it every few minutes just to make sure that it doesn't stick to the bottom of the pot. As it cooks, it's going to thicken and eventually it will turn into kind of like a porridgey texture. And I think that the frozen shredded zucchini is a great addition to this. It blends in really well into the polenta and it's a great way to use all of the frozen zucchini that we have from back in the summer. When the polenta is almost done, I'm going to cook up my shrimp. I'm putting a tablespoon of olive oil as well as half a stick of butter into a pan. Then I'm going to add in a bunch of garlic. I think I used maybe like half of an entire head of garlic here that I have chopped up and I'm going to let that cook and infuse the butter for a couple minutes. I also added some red pepper flakes. And then I'm going to add some shrimp into here. This is frozen shrimp that I've defrosted and peeled. Season that with salt and pepper, of course, and then I'm just going to let this slowly cook and almost like braise in this butter mixture. And I like to do this on very low heat so that the shrimp doesn't become tough. And they'll cook really quickly. After a couple minutes, I'll flip them. And once I flip them, I actually turn the heat off and I like to let that second side cook just in the residual heat. And this will, again, help them to stay really tender. That second side really doesn't need much to cook. 
So I'll just leave this in the pan for another 30 seconds to a minute. Just when I see that all the shrimp is nice and pink, I'll know that it's done. Time to assemble our meal and on a plate I'm going to ladle a bunch of this zucchini polenta. I think it's so pretty with those flecks of zucchini in there. And I like to do this on a plate because I think it's kind of fun to see how the polenta kind of like spreads out and makes a perfect place to spoon over our garlicky buttery shrimp. So I'm going to add the shrimp on top of that and make sure to get a lot of that garlicky butter as well and this will just be a nice sauce to have on top of the polenta because polenta can be a little bit on the more bland side so make sure you add plenty of salt and then if you mix in that garlicky butter as you eat it it's going to add lots of nice flavor to it on the side of our meal i also pulled out some dilly beans which are pickled green beans that i canned in the summer and this is a really nice little side to have along with the meal since the shrimp is very buttery and fatty it's always nice to have something that's vinegary and bright to kind of cut through some of the fattier parts of the meal so it's a really nice foil to the rest of the meal When I first decided to make this meal, I was not even thinking of shrimp and grits. I just thought that a zucchini polenta with shrimp sounded really good, but I realized that it's really close to the classic Southern meal. So I guess it makes sense that these ingredients go so well together. For the last meal I'm going to show you, I am going to be making some gochujang tofu along with some winter melon soup and also some pumpkin pancakes. I'm going to start off by making the soup and I have three carrots here that I am just going to chop into large chunks. I like to keep these in pretty large chunks so that they kind of stay intact in the soup since they're going to be cooking for quite a while and if they're really small pieces then they will fall apart. Next, I'm going to add a container of winter melon that I've pulled out of the freezer. Usually when I cut open a winter melon, I will freeze like 80% of it since a single winter melon can be about 30 pounds. So I just cut it up and I can take out one container for each week as needed to make soup. And then I'll add a quart of chicken broth to this. You can see that my chicken broth is still kind of frozen since I just took it out of the freezer that morning, but that'll be totally fine. And then I also season this with some salt. And that is pretty much everything for the soup. It's really simple, so it's a great easy thing for me to make. And I make this about once a week since we have a lot of winter melon to eat. I think this past year we grew maybe not quite 150 pounds. I think it turned out to be like 140 pounds of winter melon. So we have a lot of it to eat and this is the main way that I cook it up. I'm gonna set that aside on the stove to boil away while we prep the rest of the meal. And first I'm going to work on the tofu. So in a bowl, I'm putting a few tablespoons of cornstarch and then I'm going to season this with salt and pepper and mix it together. This is going to be kind of like the coating for the tofu that we are going to fry. Now I have a block of firm tofu that I have drained and I'm patting it dry with a paper towel. I'm going to cut this into thirds one way and then into half inch slices so that we have these nice little bite-sized nuggets of tofu. I'm going to add this into my seasoned cornstarch and try my best to mix it together. The cornstarch does tend to be a little bit clumpy and I like to just try and mix it with my hands because if I use a spoon, I might break apart some of that tofu. So I'll just try my best to get an even layer, but it really doesn't have to be perfect. The tofu will still fry really nicely even if it's not completely covered, but the cornstarch does help to give it a very nice crispy coating. In my frying pan, I'm adding a couple of tablespoons of avocado oil and I'm going to start frying my tofu. So I'm just laying that in the oil in a single layer and that will fry for about five minutes on the first side.
While that's frying, I can work on the pumpkin pancakes and I'm just going to use the same bowl that I coated my tofu in with the cornstarch. Any leftover cornstarch is going to be just fine and then I don't have to dirty another bowl. So into this bowl, I'm adding some cooked pumpkin. This was from a pumpkin that I roasted earlier in the week and I kind of just like finely chopped it up. You can also use pumpkin puree. Then I'm going to add in one small onion that I have sliced up and mix that all together. Next, I'm going to add in flour and I'm using about three quarters of a cup here. I usually don't really measure exactly. I just base it off of how many vegetables I have in there and I'll add water accordingly until I get a good consistency. And I'm also seasoning this with salt and pepper. So I'll mix all of this together and then slowly start adding in some water. I think I ended up adding about half a cup of water, but again, I will usually just eyeball this until it's a nice kind of like pancake batter consistency. So not too thick, still a little bit runny, and I'll just add more flour or water in order to get this. Once that's done, I'm just going to set it aside and we're going to fry this in the same pan after we are done frying up the tofu. I'm also going to prepare the gochujang sauce for the tofu now and in a small bowl, I have a few cloves of garlic that I have chopped up and to this, I'm going to add a tablespoon or so of gochujang, which is a Korean hot pepper paste and you can just adjust this to how spicy you like it. I'm also going to add about a teaspoon of soy sauce and then I'll add salt and pepper and then a little bit of water to thin this out about a quarter of a cup. I'm going to mix that together and set it aside for when we finish up our tofu later. Here's how the tofu is looking after a few minutes. I'm gonna go ahead and flip all of these and I'll let the second side cook for another three or four minutes. Once all of my tofu is browned really nicely, I'm going to remove them from the pan and I'm actually gonna pivot to cooking the pumpkin pancakes right now and we'll finish this tofu off at the very end. That way I can just fry everything in the same pan. So in my pan, I'm going to add some fresh oil and then I'm going to start dropping in little spoonfuls of my pumpkin pancake batter. And I like to keep them kind of on the small side so that each person can grab one and put it in their bowl. And I just think that they're really cute that way too. And you've probably noticed this is a savory pumpkin pancake. It's not like an American breakfast kind of sweet pancake. And I've taken this idea from the pancakes that you make a lot in Korean cooking. I love how they have these little pancakes that always have vegetables in them and they're almost always savory. It's a great way to cook up lots of different kinds of vegetables. And they're a great thing to make a nice big batch of and you can just like reheat it throughout the week. These pumpkin ones have been a favorite of ours recently and I also really like to make zucchini pancakes this way too. That's another great way that I have been really enjoying using our frozen shredded zucchini and I think I'll be making that next week. So I'll probably show that in another pantry meals video next time. So I'm cooking my pancakes in batches and each side cooks for about four to five minutes on a medium heat. When I'm done with each batch, I'm putting them on a sheet tray and letting that stay warm in our toaster oven that's set to about 200 degrees so that they'll still be nice and hot while I finish off the tofu.
And once all of my pancakes are removed, I can finish off the sauce for the tofu. So I'm putting in my gochujang sauce mixture and I'm gonna let that cook for a couple minutes. As it does, it's going to start thickening up and also that garlic will cook off a little bit. And once it gets to the point where when I push with my spatula, it starts leaving a streak, I'm going to add in that tofu that we previously fried and mix it around into the sauce. It will absorb a little bit of that liquid and the sauce will continue to reduce until it becomes like a really nice thick glaze. And then lastly, I'm going to finish this off with a drizzle of sesame oil and also a sprinkling of some toasted sesame seeds. All this time the winter melon soup has just been boiling away on the side and this is what it looks like you can see how the winter melon turns translucent and that's how you know it is fully cooked and it becomes very soft so each of us will get a small bowl of that and like i said this is a soup i make pretty much every single week it's a great thing to make a batch of and you can just serve a little bowl of it alongside any of your meals with a bowl of rice and some other side dishes this is the complete meal with the gochujang tofu, the pumpkin pancakes, the winter melon soup, and then I also have a little dish of some pickled carrots and daikon and some kimchi as well. So those were four different meals that we had this week using ingredients from our pantry or maybe our winter garden and also a lot of things that we grew last year that we've preserved. I hope you guys enjoyed seeing these meals and these recipes. Let me know if you try any of them out and I will see you again in the next video.